Corey is the uh, important bird area program coordinator for Audubon, Connecticut, where she works with partners, including federal and state wildlife and forestry divisions, as well as local conservation groups, to identify, protect, and enhance habitat important for bird species of conservation concern. She also coordinates and trains field technicians and volunteers in bird census techniques and oversees the development of conservation planning plans guiding landowners in the management of bird habitat. More recently, Corey has participated in forest bird habitat assessments for landowners in partnership with the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. She served her and serves on the board of the Quinnipiac Valley Audubon Society. Welcome to Corey. Birds, and they're accessible. Um, they're there. You put up feeders, you're going to have birds come to your feeders. People can 
see them. Um, and it's something that people are like, oh, I want to attract more birds to my, to my yard or my woodland. Um, or maybe I want to sort of hang in the habitat a little bit so that it's going to be better habitat for those birds. Now, I mentioned that um, a lot of our forest bird species, woodland bird species, are declining. Um, there's a number of reasons. Uh, climate change, um, we don't necessarily know if birds are going to be declining so much from climate change yet, but they're definitely shifting their, their, the area that they breed in. A lot of species that um, you know, sort of breed south of here are slowly but surely starting to make their way north. Uh, acid rain has been a problem for birds in the past. Uh, birds like the wood thrush and the miri will eat things like snails, which are, you know, kind of don't like a very acidic soil, so if you have acid rain, you can have snails, snails uh, which will impact wood thrush. Native, uh, non-native invasive pests um, of plants, so Asiatic long longhorn beetle, um, emerald patch borer, uh, are going to impact trees that are important to these bird species. And then having invasive plants like wind um, on this, or Japanese barberry in the understory, um, they may provide some habitat for birds, but not as good as native plants. Um, but the biggest one, oh, this is in the wrong place, but forest fragmentation and conversion is really what's having the largest impact on our forest breeding birds. Um, whether it's on their winter grounds down in the Caribbean or further south, during migration when they're looking for stopover habitat, or when they get up to Connecticut and New York um, and our, our, our northeast forests to breed. Um, habitat fragmentation or conversion is really what's having the most dramatic impact on, on these species. So here is a map of Connecticut. Um, and the green area is basically interior forest. This is 1985, and that's 2002. Go back again, but you can literally see our landscape changing. Um, and this is probably a landscape that has you know more habitat for forest nesting birds. And this, you know, we are slowly but surely you know losing uh, valuable habitat for for our woodland breeding bird species. Uh, here's another map that just shows. Um, watersheds where the density of housing is projected to um, increase um, in the years to come, um, specifically on privately unprotected forests. Uh, the H2H project you know, is right there, and for those areas, think um, it's low to medium change. So there is predicted to be change um, in the H2H region um, in the amount of forest that's available for birds, you know, as it slowly is converted to, to more suburban development. I just want to mention uh, two other, when you're thinking about forest birds and managing woodlands and forests, um, two of the things I want to just touch on are that um, another threat, well, our forests are all about 150 years old. About two years, 100 years ago, there were no trees in Connecticut. Um, it was charcoal harvesting or farms, there were no trees. So all of our trees have been growing sort of as agriculture has maybe moved westward, um, charcoal practices have been abandoned. So all of our trees are about the same age. Um, a healthier forest is actually a forest where you have uneven ages. Um, when a forest gets to be 400, 500 years old, you have big trees sort of falling down, um, you have younger trees coming up, and you get a patchwork of younger and older habitat. And basically you have different types of habitat within a forest or woodland, and that's going to create a variety of habitat for different types of trees. And just to touch on again, um, invasive species, while they do provide some structure and do have some nutritional value, they don't support anywhere near as many insects or bird food as native plant species do. So that's another issue that the forest birds are facing. Now, when we reach out to land, landowners are like a really, really important part of the picture. Um, this map here, or symbol here, just sort of indicates how much of our forests are public lands and how much of our forests are private lands. And public lands, so owned by the state um, or maybe municipality, is only about 17% versus the amount that's within the private sector is uh, you know, more like 83%. So, is that right? Yes, 83% of our land is in private ownership. Um, this, you can sort of see that. This graph here sort of talks about um, the number of landowners and the size of land. So. You can see there's a lot of landowners that have sort of smaller parcels, and it kind of goes down as the parcel size goes up. But what's interesting here, this other line is sort of the, the amount of forest that's owned by sort of each 
size class. So from one acre to 100 acres, if you just look at the area underneath the green line, there are, there's more forest that's owned by people who own just one to 100 acres by far than people who own about 100 to 500 acres or 500 to 5,000 acres. So the majority of, so the people who are going to have the impact on our forest are the people who only own 100 acres or less. So that, those people, um, which are the people that I think you guys are interacting with, um, are really key to making sure that our food and nesting birds are here for your I think that's a powerful message. Um, here's just a map showing the Hudson Tusitonic area. Um, the green is forest or woodland. So you can see that there's a large area of woodland in this, in this area. Um, I also want to note that this area is particularly important to migratory birds. Um, uh, American Cannon, who's been an intern for the High School Museum, has done an analysis on migratory birds' stockover habitat in Fairfield County. And one of the things that has come out is that Particularly along the coast, those areas are very, very important to migrating birds. Um, how many of you guys have ever seen birds migrating on radar? <coughs> Anyone? Well, in fall, spring and fall migration, if you just go to like, the National Weather Service and look at the radar maps, right at sunset, you'll suddenly see that everything lights up and it looks like it's raining everywhere. Those are birds. So you can actually take that data and look at where birds are stopping on their migration. Um, you know, as they're moving north or south. So, uh, and one thing that Mary found was that along the coast was particularly important for, for birds that were migrating um, in Fairfield County. So, you know, the H2H region is definitely important for forestry nesting birds. It's also important for birds that are just migrating into the area. So, in order to reach out to landowners and get them to start thinking about, you know, managing their land with birds in mind, um, Audubon, Connecticut, a forest bird initiative um, that features workshops and habitat assessments and we're also getting started on some bird surveys as well. Um, we have workshops for landowners that um, you know where we try to foster awareness about the importance of the forest as habitat for birds. Um, it often includes a field trip to a managed woodland, so an area where maybe there's been some forest management techniques that have been applied to sort of improve the habitat for birds. So the landowners can actually see what that looks like. Um, and then we also have, we typically have had somebody from the NRCS, the National Resource Conservation Service, come to the workshop as well to talk about funding opportunities um, through NRCS to help landowners, you know, say, write management plans for their land or um, start working on invasive species management or maybe doing a small cut. Um, those are, you know, want them to be aware of those opportunities. Um, a habitat assessment um, is a walk with a landowner of their property. Um, it includes an Audubon biologist, um, a, service, or, or a yeah, service forester, and then also the Connecticut Agriculturalist Experiment Station comes with us. Um, we walk the property with the landowner, and um, they get a report in the end sort of based on the walk through the property. I want to tell you a little bit more about, about what a habitat assessment is. So, um, actually, first I'm just, I know one of the things we were supposed to talk about is just how we're reaching them. Um, so for, to get people interested in, in workshops about birds or about um, these habitat assessments that Audubon is providing for free for the next two years, um, we've tried postcards, presentations, um, we did participate in a woods forum, uh, we had our forest bird workshops, uh, word of mouth, whether it was the friend or relative of Forester, an Audubon staff member or partner, website, Facebook, uh, newsletter, poster, or maybe just posting on the server. But this is where the people we have done test and testing support have come from. Um, I think what stands out the most here is that just that word of mouth, that face-to-face -face time with somebody else really seems to, to get people interested. Um, whether it was an Audubon staff person, one of our partners, a forester who heard about the program from a presentation at the Society of American Foresters and then went out and told land owners they were working with, friends or relatives, but word of mouth, that face-to-face -face time that you might get in a woods forum or some other workshop is what really got people excited about you know, wanting to participate in this program. So just a little bit more about habitat assessments. Um, during a habitat assessment, 
Uh, you get a whole team of people, or a landowner gets a whole team of people to come out and walk your land with them. Um, it includes people from Audubon, Connecticut. There I am there, my field clothes, with a different outfit. Um, and then you've got Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station staff, um, and, and, a, and a forester as well. And uh, but the most important person on this team is the landowner. So you know, the landowner gets this opportunity to have all these people come out and walk their land with them. Um, and we did about 40 of these habitat assessments this last year, and I think on 37 of them, the landowner came along. And so it's their opportunity to sort of walk the land and go, oh, what do you think of this over here? Get all those questions answered that they have, um, you know, building up in their mind. And they've got experts who give them the answers right there on their properties. Uh, I think it's something that they get really excited about, and then you point out some words to them too, and, and they get even more excited. Um, so I just think that this is kind of the part of the program that, that really, really gets landowners interested. While we're out there with them, we talk about you know, what they're seeing in their woodlands and how different components of the habitat are going to be beneficial to birds. So, an uh, understory, a dense understory, is something that's attractive to black and blue warblers. Particularly a thick mountain laurel grove. You'll have black or blue warblers nesting in mountain laurel. Um, having snags, so dead trees, is going to be attracted to woodpeckers, like a yellow belly sapsucker. Um, a dense mid story is going to be something that can be important to a wood thrush. Okay. And if we're birding, but we, we do these surveys during the breeding season, because so all the birds are singing <coughs> at the same time. So you know, a lot of times you'll hear the birds and then Theory. Wood thrush. Thinking that 
about ways that they could improve their habitat or, or take care of their food. Um, and uh, this is just an, an example of some of the, the management techniques. But one thing I want to point out is if you have a landowner who maybe is not too into the idea of cutting down a bunch of trees, the recommendations will reflect that. So if you know if someone doesn't really want to cut down any trees, then their recommendations are going to be more like uh, plant more native shrubs along edges, um, do some invasive management, um, make sure that you have these snags in your forest. Um, so it, it can be sort of changed up a bit, you know, depending on the landowner values and what they're interested in. Um, again, here's our recent example of the report, but it generally talks about what habitats are on the property, what birds are using those habitats, um, and then it makes recommendations for how the woodlands can be managed slightly differently um, to provide better habitat for birds. Um, this map just sort of shows where we're generally the blue and yellow blobs are kind of the areas that we're primarily doing habitat assessments, but they're not the only areas where we're doing these habitat assessments for our um, We're looking to work with people who have, you know, maybe, maybe 20 acres and up. Um, I know in this area of the state, maybe landowners have less than that, but if you had a neighborhood, a group of landowners who wanted to collectively sort of think about their land together as a sort of one unit, um, we could go out and do this sort of uh, habitat assessment and then provide a report that those landowners share amongst themselves. So it could be made available to people who have less than um, Now, if you have working with a landowner and they have a smaller parcel, so maybe they only have five acres, um, and you also want to let you guys know about um, the National Audubon Society, which Audubon Connecticut is a state office of the National Audubon Society. Um, they have a program that's starting up this spring that's going to be sort of a native plants for birds initiative. It's very new, it's kind of just building up right now. Um, but the goal there is just to change people's, um, how people maintain outdoor spaces. So people who have, you know, maybe five acres or less, you know, they're, they're yards, they're in their yards, they consider landscaping. To sort of change their mentality so that they don't think about just having lawn, um, but they think about having lots of gardens and lots of native plants. So that's going to be better for habitat for, for birds during migration. Um, a bird that's migrating through an area, you know, it's going to need to stop and rest from the fuel. But if there's not enough sort of supplies for it to, to sort of get its energy pumped up again and then move on, it's going to have to spend longer at that location, or maybe sort of sneak off to a slightly different location. Uh, and it's going to bend it to the breeding to the breeding grounds late, um, and its reproductive success is going to be impacted by that. So um, even if you have working with a landowner who just has you know three, four, five acres, they can still be doing that are going to be positively affecting birds. Um, and that's what this initiative is all about, working with those people who have, you know, just a few acres, but want to be managed, working, doing things for their yards that are going to be better um, Just a few examples of what that would include would be uh, layers of native trees and shrubs, uh, bird-like structure, so areas that have perennial shrubs, and then trees, well, deciduous and coniferous, it's going to be good for habitat. Um, yards that have host plants for lepidoptera, or caterpillars, things like dogwoods, milkweed, blueberries. They produce lots of caterpillars, which is lots of bird food. Um, seed producing perennials, you know, again, it's a plant that's producing a food source for birds. And then um, crab apples are just a species that's one of the few exceptions to the native rule. Um, there isn't a native crab apple tree in the sort of Connecticut area, but they do have their blossoms track insects which are eaten by birds in the spring, and then a lot of birds eat the apples in the fall. So that's a species that tends to make good stuff over habitat. Uh, and there's additional benefits to creating stuff over habitat for birds. They're also increasing the diversity and abundance of insects, um, particularly the pollinators. Um, a lot of our bee species are declining. Um, you're providing more resources, resources, resources for birds that are breeding in the area. Um, and as somebody mentioned earlier, it's a healthier watershed too. When you plant a bunch of native plant species, they're acting as a good buffer. Um, they're absorbing rainwater. Um, and the more sort of native plants and gardens you have, the less pesticides and herbicides you need to use on your lawn. So that's a good, something that's going to be healthy for too. Um, 
Well, just one last thing about the well, we we'll talked a lot about the plants. So in the interest of time, I'm going to pass through this slide. But just a, this is an overview of the bingo. This is the number of caterpillars that you look. So you can see that oak tree is going to have a lot more food than uh, than the non-native bingo. Um, and a bird like the chickadee, for it to raise one nest, needs about 480. 4,800 caterpillars, which equates to about an acre of oak trees. So, um, you know, having caterpillars and native trees is really good thing. But um, when Audubon launches this native plants campaign um, in a few months, and it is pending funding to some degree. So, some of it may launch, some of it may not, depending on funding. But hopefully, hopefully, all of it will launch. Um, but there's going to be there's going to be two or three camps sort of strategy. Um, and it's going to target sort of do-it-yourselfers, people who, you know, just need a little bit of information and then just go for it and, you know, tear up their lawns and put in lots of native plants and no issues. Um, and then there's just people who are going to need some help. So you might need tools, might need training, might need support. People who are going to have questions and want, and want some answers. Um, so for those two groups of people, um, we'll have online resources for the do-it-yourselfers. And then we're hoping to at, um, offer what we're going to call a walk around for those people who, who want some help. The walk around will be sort of similar to a habitat assessment, where um, either someone from Audubon or a volunteer who's been trained by Audubon would go and walk the property um, with the landowner um, and help them sort of understand how they can change the way they're currently using their yards so they can better habitat. Uh, online resources that we're hoping to have will include things like plant guides and tips that are specific to Connecticut. Um, has anybody ever read the book, Bringing Nature Home by Douglas Calamay? He's, he's going to be working on county-specific plant lists for each bird you know, for each area of the country, actually. So that's the sort of resources that we're hoping are going to be available um, on our websites going forward. Um, right now, if you just go to uh, our, our website, so ctaudubon.org, slash ESC, which stands for Bird Friendly Communities. You can find some resources already. Um, and we do have a Pinterest account, too, that's Audubon Connecticut ESC, um, that also has additional resources on helping, um, you know, for managing, thinking about how to make the yard better for migrating birds. And then just a little bit about the walk-arounds. Um, there is a cost for the walk-arounds, because it, you know, it takes up a lot of money to sort of have a person come to your yard or even a well-trained volunteer come to your yard. So it's typically about $100 per hour for your typical backyard. Um, and this we're hoping to be able to start in the spring. Um, but then pending funding, we'd also like to start a Habit and Habitat Advanced Years training program. And this is where we would train volunteers, which could be people from land trusts, um, in these techniques on how to sort of, you know, create bird-friendly habitat in your backyard. Um, and then you would be able to go to the landowners and sort of help their yards for them and give them the training. So um, there's a lot still to think about this. Like I mentioned, it's just pending funding. Um, but it is a program that we are hoping to be able to introduce in the next the six, six months to a year. So just something to keep on your radar. But um, that's about it about bird friendly or bird programs. But um, if you'd like to learn more about the Forest Bird Program,